we got results earlier this week in California. And just before we went on air today, we got the, the Georgia bar exam results. And I want to talk about those results. And then I want to uh, talk with you about some lessons learned from the February 2017 exam, or at least the first set of lessons. I've got four lessons that I think uh, we want to uh, pay attention to. Let me start first with the results. In California, as you've undoubtedly heard, uh, we have another in a continuing series of train wrecks. Uh, if I were a Credence Clearwater fan, and I am, I would say there was a bad moon rising. Here's the numbers that we've got from the California bar examiners. There were 4,439 applicants for the exam, um, of whom only 26% were first time takers. That means 74% are repeaters. Uh, I just want that number to soak in. There are three to one more repeat bar takers than first time takers. So that's the world that we're living in now. And that's pretty, pretty much the case across the country, more repeaters than first time takers in February. The passing rate in California for first time applicants, 39%. The passing rate for repeat applicants, 33%. Whoa, doggy, that's pretty awful. The overall pass rate, uh, when we get to, you know, how did everybody do is pretty awful. Uh, we end up, uh, yeah, 33% overall, uh, which is horrible, horrible. When we get to repeaters, Oh my gosh, some of these numbers are staggering. Um, if you went to a California ABA school and you're a repeater, 46% pass rate. Uh, but if you went to an unaccredited fixed facility school in California, 2% pass rate for repeat bar takers. It's horrible. Um, these numbers are staggering. For the attorney's exam, 44% passed. In other words, when we look at the exam, literally only one out of three applicants passed. Now, these are the worst results in 10 years on the February exam. They're pretty much as bad as it has ever been. Um, there is obviously a great hue and cry that the cut score, the passing score in California has got to be lowered. In essence, you need a 144 scaled multi-state in California. To put that into comparison, in uh, Florida, you need a 136. In New York, you need a 133. Um, do you really have to be 11 points smarter to practice law in California than New York? It's hard to imagine that. Um, but if you're waiting for that to happen, to change, yeah, uh, you're going to grow old. It's going to take time if it happens at all. Now, the good news, and there's a little bit of good news, I think, is that the bar exam is changing the format in California starting in July. It's a two-day test. The multi-state will now be weighted 50% instead of 35%. And I, we had some students who had really good multi-state scores for whom, if they'd been able to use that 50-50 weighting, would have been either close to or over the pass rate. So it is going to make a difference for some people. It will also be, as a two-day exam, only five essays and one performance test of 90 minutes instead of two performance tests of three hours. So I think that in all of these circumstances, these are good things. And I think that there is some reason for optimism that we will see these numbers come up slightly, uh, kind of as we saw numbers come up in New York when it went to the UBE. Um, not anything to write home about, but definitely uh, some, some opportunities there, I think, for people. Um, we had some wins among our students. I want to just share again one of the real frustrations, and Kelly and June and I were talking about this before we went online today. And um, one of the things that's so frustrating to me is that we have people who get these big wins in these states, they pass, and for whatever reason, they just don't want to talk about them. They, they're not anxious to tell the world how many times they failed before they passed, or they don't like being on the camera. I can understand that. <laughs> I'm actually quite thin and very tall. You know, um, but the there are a lot of reasons that people don't want to share. They don't want to be a humble brag. They don't want anybody to think they're bragging. They don't want their employer to know they took the bar. I mean, there's you can just go on and on and on with these lists of things. Unfortunately, it means that we can't tell you all the great stuff we get to hear. Uh, I am pleased, though, that we do have people in every jurisdiction who've agreed to share their stories. And we tell those stories uh, on our Web page. Uh, if you look under case studies at celebrationbarreview.com, you can find those video interviews. We also do them as podcasts. And if you're in our course, you will also see them on the Facebook group. Uh, and I really encourage you to, to check those out. In addition, a lot of those folks 
uh, stay in the Facebook group and help out current existing students. And we are so grateful to the ones that have done that. Uh, but I've had some great interviews in the last couple of weeks. I've got a bunch of them stacked up to do from across the country uh, and really looking forward to doing those. But um, I just want you to know that there are people who do pass the bar, even when it's a 33% pass rate. Uh, and I'm going to have more to say about the pass rates here in just a moment. But that's California. Those are the numbers. Uh, pretty staggering. Um, the multi-state score, by the way, in California is higher than it is nationally. Uh, the average was uh, uh, 1379 or a one, almost a 138 in California, but the national average was a 134. So California students do better on the multi-state than everybody else. They just don't do well enough. They needed 144s. All right. Well, then, uh, just a few hours ago, we got Georgia results out. Uh, these came out a bit earlier than we expected, but they're here now. And this is the last major jurisdiction to release results. There were 642 people that took the exam in Georgia. Uh, of those, a uh, total of 51.1% passed. That's a win. Anytime you're over 50% these days, that feels like a win. Um, the first time taker pass rate was 68.3% but the repeat bar taker pass rate was only 37.9. What's interesting again is that there were more repeat bar takers than first time takers. 364 repeaters in the exam, only 278 first time takers. Um, so that's why we've got a lower overall pass rate. Some interesting numbers from the first quick analysis is um, that uh, uh, we see a ABA approved schools in Georgia, only a 48% pass rate uh, for all applicants. Uh, from the Board of Examiner approved schools, that would be Atlanta Law and John Marshall, there were only eight people that took the exam, but none of them passed. And then when we get to foreign trained uh, applicants, which is something relatively new in Georgia, there were 16 foreign trained applicants across the state, only two of them passed. So. Um, not really encouraging numbers. It's a very tough exam. There's a lot that, that makes it a challenging circumstance. So uh, that's the numbers that we've got. We did get some good results from some of our students, uh, and we will try and share some of those stories. So um, definitely want to congratulate those that did pass. For those that did not, uh, we'll continue to work with you and, and do everything we can to help you. All right. So that's Georgia, at least the early numbers. We'll see more, I'm sure, as we go along. But I wanted to share with you, uh, as I looked at these numbers today, and not even knowing the Georgia numbers are going to come in, I wanted to talk about some lessons that I think we can learn from the February 2017 exam results. And there are four lessons that I think are particularly important. So here we go. The first lesson, I, I guess in the theme of my football uh, analogies these days, you remember that the NFL talks about respect the shield. They talk about the NFL shield and respecting the the, the uh, sanctity of the, the game or the shield. Uh, maybe we could say the same thing about the FBI these days. I don't know. But respect the shield is the first lesson I think we have to take. And by shield, I mean respect what the bar examiners are doing and who they are. And, you know, I'm a critic of the bar examiners, uh, and I've been a critic for a long time. I think that, that it's a, uh, a system that doesn't work very well right now. It's a system where there seem to be quotas in a lot of states, fixed numbers of members that are being admitted, no matter what the scores are. However, I think that one of the problems these days is that there are a number of bar takers who don't take the exam seriously enough. Now, I'm not talking about the people that are... Um, maybe first time takers and they're, they're scared to death of it. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but I think there are a lot of people who just get into the habit of taking the bar exam. They don't expect to pass and they don't take the exam seriously. Um, I had a phone call with someone today who told me that they had failed the bar exam. It's not one of our students. They had failed the bar exam a number of times, uh, but they had been a rep for a big box bar review. And so they could keep getting a course for free. And why should they spend money to study for the bar exam they were just gonna put in a few hours and try and do a little better because they had fallen 12 points short. They just try and do a little better uh, and get over the top. And I think that that actually disrespects the process. The bar examiners have written tests across the country that really are good at delivering consistent results for consistent inputs. If you do the same thing, you get the same results. And when people think somehow that they can do it just a little different, just a little different, and get a big change in their results, it just doesn't happen. 
And so you've got to take this exam seriously. Whatever the state is that you're in, you've got to treat it like a full-time big task, a big job. Now, that doesn't mean you have to stop work or ignore your family or move into a monastery, but you've got to be serious about what you're doing. It takes dedication. I'm, I agree with those of you that say that. You've got to be doing what it takes. Now, in my view, there are two things that you've got to do. You've got to give enough time to the process and you have to give enough resources. Time, for our purposes, means about 300 hours of study time. Now, as I'm talking to you today, we're at uh, about 66, 67 days to the exam. So if you are just starting today, you're at about four or five hours a day. That's manageable. It can be done even at this point. If you started earlier, you may not have to put in anywhere near that much, but ultimately you need about 300 hours. People who think they can prepare for the exam in 100 hours are delusional. It doesn't happen. And so you've got to give it enough time. Secondly, you've got to put in the resources. Look, I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm so pleased that so many of you are in our course. I appreciate your confidence in us. Um, I appreciate particularly those of you that have uh, made the sacrifice to buy a personal course or a premium course. You're buying as much mentoring as you can get. Some of you in the basic course are buying a la carte mentoring. Okay, that's good. But, you know, there are some of you that really are just looking for the cheapest way to get through this. And there was a time when that would work. There was a time when you looked for the lowest cost provider because everybody passed. But folks, those times are gone and you should get as much help as you can afford. Now, if all you can afford is our basic course, that's awesome. We have people that pass every exam every time using the basic course. Absolutely. And we interview them and talk to them. We have people that have passed the cow bar using a cell phone and the least expensive course that we offer. It happens. But in general, the more resources you can put at this, the better off you're going to be. Don't cheat yourself uh, by having come this far and then saying, yeah, I don't really want to spend that extra, you know, how many ever dollars because, uh, you know, it would be expensive. Yeah, but you've put this much in. Don't be silly. OK, uh, and so I just want to say the first lesson is this bar exam across the country is tough and you will not beat it without time and resources. Second lesson, just kind of riffing on different things here. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now, Roosevelt said it much better and with a much better accent. But I would tell you this, the test, the bar exam as a whole is manageable. It is not impossible. Some of you have taken the view uh, in our course and elsewhere, that it is impossible to pass the bar. This is a self-defeating proposition. If you believe you can't pass, you will not pass. The reality is that people pass every exam every time. It's one of the reasons why I try to encourage our students who pass to share their story. And trust me, I do everything short of bribery uh, to get them to come on with me and talk about it. And I don't think it's because they don't want to say that, that our course works. I think the reality is they just are embarrassed in many cases and they don't wanna share it. But here's the reality of what goes on. Many people have come to believe that if they don't see a lot of stories of people passing from us or other people, that that means no one passes. That's not true. People do pass. And so the test is manageable. And I think the question that many people ask is, well, what makes it passable for some and not for others? Is it because some people are smarter or work harder? And my answer would be in general, no. Most people are about the same level of intelligence for the bar, and most people put in about the same amount of work. There are people at the extremes in both intelligence and work. That's not the point. The point is, how do you prepare? What systems do you use? What approach do you take? And if you're doing a good job of those things, then you get better results. We pretty consistently outperform these results because we work with people who do and approach the exam differently, even though we're working with a more at-risk population in many cases than the traditional all first-time bar takers. So I would start by simply reminding yourself that the test is manageable. You should expect to pass, not expect to fail. What happens when you're afraid? It'll paralyze you. It'll just stop you in your tracks. It'll cause you to give up. It'll cause you to become distracted. It'll cause you to become angry. It'll cause you to uh, look for defects when there are none. It will cause you to doubt yourself, to doubt your bar review, to doubt your mentors, to doubt your law school, to doubt your family, to doubt your faith, to doubt everything. And then you're of no use to anyone. Don't let fear paralyze you. If you're feeling that fear and you're in our course, join our group coaching, or if you're in the personal course or premium course, talk to me about it. 
we can deal with those things. Use the paraliminals. We've got some great ones to deal with fear and anxiety uh, that I think will really help you. But don't let the fear get in, its, get in your way. Keep moving forward. The third lesson I think we can draw from the February exam results is that you need to ignore the, the universe of alternate facts. Now, I'm not being political here, but obviously the term alternate facts has come into our discourse these days. And I would tell you that just like there are pundits on the nightly news, depending on which cable network you're watching, there are a series of talking heads. I would say most of those folks are ignorant. Doesn't matter which side of the spectrum you're on, they're just ignorant. They just say stupid things. <laughs> and they get paid to do it. Who knew? But most of the people that are pundits about the bar exam are equally stupid. There are alternate facts about the bar exam that are so absurdly ridiculous that it's hard to even know where to start. I try to debunk these myths periodically uh, to say things like the change in the number of questions on the bar that, that counted didn't actually make a difference. And people went crazy. And they said, oh, no, 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 that's going to be a terrible difference. It's going to kill the MBE. It's going to drop the score. Nine-tenths of one point. That's what it did. Nine-tenths of one point. There are so many alternate facts out there. There are the, the alternate fact people that say the only way you can pass is to issue spot and memorize the rules, which is precisely what the big box courses that prepare 90% of the bar takers in America teach. Uh, news alert. 90% of those people are being taught that form and 33% are passing in Florida and 33% in California and 51% in Georgia and 48% in New York and the UBE. Really? You think that's the only way to study and be successful? The numbers would suggest it's not a very successful method at all. There are these alternate facts out there. And if you buy into them, if you get sucked into them, it's really going to hurt you. Pick your course, pick your approach, and then follow it. But ignore the alternate facts. Ignore all the people telling you what's going on. Look, I've been, I've not been a fan of above the law ever. Um, I think they are some of the snarkiest, snobbiest, uh, most uh, arrogant people, you know, who want to remind you on a regular basis that they went to Harvard and you didn't. Um, and they are great at just snarky. That's what they do best. And they love to go out and say, oh, this law school sucks and these people suck and these people suck and these people suck. And after a while, it's like, OK, so apparently the only people that know anything about the law are Ellie Mistel and, uh, you know, his friends. OK, great. But it's an alternate fact. It's not the reality of the bar exam. And you should be very careful about buying in too deeply to any of that uh, discussion that's going on. Likewise, there are a number of law school professors and deans who are spinning an alternate reality about the bar exam. It may or may not be true. I think there's plenty of reasons to believe that what they're telling their students to do with the bar is not accurate. And so I think you want to be very careful about being in a bubble where that's all you hear and you start to believe that that's the truth. You know, the law schools are saying, oh, we, we just need more resources for our students. And the bar examiners are saying, oh, no, the students are stupid. Um, and, you know, what is that all about? It, it's, it's silly and it's crazy stuff. You can see I get worked up about this. So lesson number three, ignore alternate facts. Get out of the basement. Lesson number four, last lesson, do not be one of the walking dead. Had somebody on a webinar yesterday who said, I said, what's the thing that's keeping you from optimizing your study? And they said, well, I watch Netflix. <laughs> okay, it's pretty good. Um, you know, but I think that being one of the walking dead here means more than just watching Netflix or whatever network uh, that uh, particular show. It's HBO, isn't it? Uh, in any event, I don't want you taking the zombie bar review. Here's what I think we learned from February 2017. If you just keep doing the same thing, if you're a zombie marching onward, doing the same thing, you are going to get whatever happens to zombies, right? You're just, you're just going to be among the living dead all the time. It isn't going to change. This test is not getting easier. It is not moving in a direction that rewards that kind of behavior. So what do you do? I think you have to be proactive. If you're in our course, take advantage of all the resources that we have to offer. Use photo reading, use the paraliminals, use the meditation, attend the group coaching, uh, purchase the personal mentoring, participate in what we're talking about and doing. Engage in the writing process and the MBE intuitive study process. If you're not in our course and you're listening to this or watching this, then you really need to think about what you're doing. If it's the same old, same old, you're going to get the same old results. And it's pretty clear from looking across the country at all these results, the same old results aren't going to work very well for most people. And so 
you've got a choice. You can be a zombie or you can come alive and say, you know what? I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to do the things I need to do to be successful on the exam. And I think that's manageable. And I think if you take all of those lessons together, it's reason actually to be hopeful in spite of all of the bad news that we've got. If you respect the process, you respect the shield, if you don't give in to the fear, if you ignore the alternate facts and the people that are out there spinning those silly stories, and if you don't become part of the zombie bar review, the walking dead, I think you can pass the bar. And we see that happen over and over again for students that wake up and say, you know what, I'm just going to change what I'm doing. I'm going to do it a different way, a better way. 